The Prince of Wales pays tribute to his father, the Duke of Edinburgh, as the details of the royal funeral are revealed. Prince Charles says he was a much-loved figure who gave the most remarkable, devoted service to the Queen, his country and the Commonwealth. My dear papa was, uh, was a very special person who, I think above all else, would have been amazed by the reaction and the touching things that have been said about him. During the day, there were gun salutes across the country and around the world to mark the Duke's death. His funeral will be held at Windsor Castle on Saturday. There'll be just 30 in the congregation and a minute's silence across the country. But we'll be reflecting on the Duke's life and his decades of campaigning for nature and the environment. Many other times, Rachel Bradmore raises the bar still higher. And history is made at Aintree as Rachel Blackmore becomes the first female jockey to win the Grand National. Hello, very good evening to you. The Prince of Wales has tonight paid tribute to his father, the Duke of Edinburgh, saying he and the royal family miss him enormously. The Duke died yesterday, aged 99, at Windsor Castle. Prince Charles said he'd given the most remarkable service to the Queen and the country and was a much-loved figure. His comments came as details were announced this afternoon of the Duke's funeral. It will be next Saturday at 3 p.m. at St George's Chapel in Windsor. There'll be a one-minute silence held nationally at the same time. Earlier in the day, gun salutes took place to mark the Duke's death, as our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. At midday, in the four nations of the United Kingdom, 41 gun salutes sounded in tribute to the Duke. And for a man who served in the Royal Navy in the Second World War and later, guns were fired in tribute aboard several warships Fire! and in Gibraltar, home to the Royal Navy's Gibraltar Squadron. At Windsor Castle, the Earl of Wessex arrived with his wife to join the Queen in the family's mourning as officials put the finishing touches to the plans for the Duke's funeral. It will take place at 3 o'clock next Saturday afternoon at St George's Chapel inside Windsor Castle. No part of the funeral will be accessible to the public. The Duke's coffin will be borne in a ceremonial procession from the castle's state apartments to the chapel. The coffin will be borne on a Land Rover which the Duke helped to design. Members of the royal family will walk behind the coffin. There will be a national one-minute silence when the coffin reaches the chapel at three o'clock. Inside the chapel, the congregation will be limited to 30. The Prime Minister won't be attending to free his place for the family. Members of the public are advised not to go to Windsor. The best place to watch it will be on television, said a palace spokesman. From his Highgrove home, the Prince of Wales has paid this tribute to his father. As you can imagine, uh, my family and I miss my father enormously. He was a, a much loved and appreciated figure. And uh, apart from anything else, I can imagine, and we're so deeply touched by uh, the number of other people here and elsewhere around the world in the Commonwealth who also, I think, share our loss and our sorrow. And uh, my, my dear papa, was, uh, was a very special person who, I think above all else, would have been amazed by the reaction and the touching things that have been said about him. And from that point of view, we are, my family, deeply grateful for all that. It will sustain us in this particular loss and at this particularly sad time. Other family tributes to the Duke were paid in a special BBC programme. His appreciation of how he could help the 
Queen always seemed to be present in terms of supporting her because she was very young when she became Queen and it needed to be, I think, a, a double act for a lot of that time in order to, to allow her to take on that role. My father was always a, was always a great source of, of support and, and encouragement. Um, it was, it was uh, and, and, and guidance all the way through and never trying to curtail any of the activities or anything that we wanted to try and do, but, but always encourage that. And, um, and I always, always remember and, and, and thank him for that. I think I will best remember him as always being there and a person you could bounce off ideas, but if you were having problems, you could always go to him and know that he would listen and try to help. Back in Windsor, after their meeting with the Queen, the Earl and Countess of Wessex departed from the castle. How was the Queen? She'd been amazing, the Countess said. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. Well, despite the authorities urging people to stay away from royal residences because of coronavirus restrictions, a steady stream of well-wishers has been turning up at both Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle throughout the day. Our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, is at Windsor for us tonight with more. Daniela. Well, Kate, the message is clear from the royal family, from the government and from the police. They want a quiet, restrained, socially distanced remembrance of the Duke of Edinburgh. And for his funeral here next weekend, they are urging everyone to stay away. In this royal town, a military tribute to start the day. A salute and a silence. Through Windsor, there was a steady stream of people from early this morning. Curious locals and those making a longer trip, some paying their respects with their own flourish. But the advice from the royal family and the police has been consistent. Stay away and avoid large gatherings. It's the same message for the Duke's funeral next weekend. For many, though, there was a need to be here in person. It is such an important moment. We cannot not show the, the respect and, and, and support for our Queen with physical acts, because in the digital age, sometimes, you know, leave it a digital footprint, I don't think it's enough. People are behaving very well. It's really nice. They're maintaining distance and everything. So I did think twice before coming, and I know the suggestion is to um, just observe on telly. Um, but I thought I'd try, and since there it's quiet, I thought I'd just come in, lay my flowers um, and leave. People have been extremely sensible. I mean, there aren't mobs around, you know, people are respecting the day and respecting the, the COVID and the situation we're in. Windsor is a town used to turning out for events of national significance. Most are celebratory, like the Queen's 90th birthday, with her husband by her side. They are very much part of the rhythm of life here. To be asked to stay away is so different from what normally happens. But that is the request for next Saturday. There'll be a heavy police presence and people will be told not to gather. And instead, stay home to remember the Duke and what Buckingham Palace has described as his remarkable life. Daniela Ralph, BBC News, Windsor. Well, our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell is with me now looking at the details that we know, uh, Nick, 30 guests at the funeral, perhaps actually as the Duke would have preferred it, but certainly I would imagine some difficult decisions for the Royal Family. Some extremely difficult decisions, yes, but of course the, the kind of decisions that people, families across the country have been having to make. Now I've just been making my own list and you get to 30 very quickly. This is a large family. So, a ceremonial royal funeral, that's the, the official term, that's one level down from a full state funeral, a head of state or an exceptional other like Sir Winston Churchill gets the full state funeral. This is the same level as Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother had back in 2002, but on a much more limited scale. A, because that's what the Duke wanted, a minimum 
fuss, B, because of the COVID restrictions. No public access, no public participation. Just this uh, small ceremonial procession down through the castle to the chapel. And inside the chapel, one supposes that everyone will have to wear a mask. Now, Prince Harry coming in from California, he will be expected to quarantine for five days, have to take a COVID test. Uh, uh, he will have an opportunity now, of course. Oh, I should just mention the Duchess of Sussex not coming for medical reasons. She is pregnant. An opportunity now for Harry and William to have a healing moment, perhaps within the context, the perspective that is induced by a funeral. So for them, that is uh, an opportunity that they will have. No crowds, no public participation. The advice from the palace is watch it on television. But notwithstanding that, it importantly will be an opportunity for the royal family to say their final farewells. Nicholas, thank you. Well, tributes to the Duke have continued to be paid around the world. As Australians woke on Saturday to the news of Prince Philip's death, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison said his life had been one of duty, service, loyalty and honour. Our Sydney correspondent Shaima Khalil has sent this report. Honouring a life of duty and service. A sign of respect for a man who for decades has had a long and enduring relationship with this country. The Prime Minister paid tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, whose presence, he said, was a reminder of the stability needed in a world that can often be uncertain. Memories of him will, of course, tell stories of his candour and a unique and forceful and authentic personality. But above all, he was a man who was steadfast, who could be relied upon, always standing by his queen. Prince Philip's military services first brought him here in 1940. But it was in 1954 that he arrived alongside the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth on an historic visit, the first by a reigning monarch to Australia. Troops and representatives of many Australasian lands. The Duke visited more than 20 times and has fostered a close connection with the country and its people. At times, taking a moment to enjoy the famed Aussie lifestyle. Throughout the decades, Prince Philip was patron to nearly 50 organizations here, but it's his character, his candor, his ability to be himself that have endeared him to so many Australians. More than 700,000 young Australians have taken part in the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. Sarah Yoko started when she was 16. I don't think I would have been able to actually participate in community events or participate in uh, physical activity and learn these new skills that I got to learn without the award kind of pushing me to do that. The Duke was also a well-known figure in New Zealand. He appreciated a traditional welcome, but his focus was always on supporting young people. For over 50 years, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards have connected him to thousands of New Zealand young people. And of course, perhaps most importantly, he has served in support of Her Majesty the Queen for many, many years in her service to New Zealand, the Commonwealth, and indeed the world. In Australia, the Duke of Edinburgh has always been warmly welcomed, and he'll be fondly remembered by the politicians and the public alike. Shaima Khalil, BBC News, Sydney. Well, Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta said the Duke had been a towering symbol of family values. Prince Philip was visiting Kenya, of course, with his wife when her father, King George VI, died and she ascended the throne. Our Africa correspondent Catherine Bayarahunga sent this report from there. The royal visitors stepped off into the hot sunshine of Nairobi. It was just in 1952, a young Princess Elizabeth and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, were at the start of a tour, standing in for her father, King George VI, who was too ill to travel. The couple took in the sights, but little did they know that destiny was waiting in the wings. Half an hour after their arrival came the first engagement. Nearly all the people they met here have passed away. But in 2015, the BBC spoke to a man who spent time with them. She was a young, beautiful lady and 
her husband. He was a big man. And it was here at the treetops lodge that everything changed for the couple. During an overnight stay, the princess became the monarch after her father died. Following their stay here at treetops, the queen and the duke were catapulted into 70 years of service, not only to the United Kingdom, but the Commonwealth as well. And this was the start of years of friendship and partnership that the prince had with this continent. As the queen's consort, the prince accompanied her on numerous tours in Africa. The first years of her reign saw a rise in independence struggles and the British Empire retreated. Prince Philip often represented her at ceremonies to hand over power, like this one in Nairobi. Today, on the world's youngest continent, the prince has left another legacy. Over 400,000 people in Africa are currently taking part in the Duke of Edinburgh International Award, transforming their lives. I think the fact that he was able to come up with a program that changes life. Because even hundreds of years to come, I can tell you that this program will still be in existence. 30 years after that fateful visit, the royal couple returned to treetops. They had experienced so much, but perhaps this place represented the moment that defined both their lives. Catherine Biarahanga, BBC News, Treetops, Kenya. Well, Prince Philip will uh, also be remembered as one of the first people in the public eye to champion the cause of conservation. For nearly 20 years, he was president of the World Wildlife Fund, now the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And even after stepping down, he remained an active campaigner, as our science and environment editor David Shookman reports. Nature was one of Prince Philip's great loves, and the need to conserve it became a lifelong passion. He fought not just for endangered species, but for the whole of the natural world. We depend on being part of the web of life. We depend on every other living thing on this planet, just as much as they depend on us. From his earliest official visits around the globe, this one to Antarctica, wildlife was always a theme. He used his position to inspire younger generations. In this lecture for 2,000 children, many of the pictures were his. I don't think I'll tell you which are mine, but if you ever see a very bad one, you'll know. An emerging theme was our responsibility. If we as humans have got this power of, of life and death, not, not just life and death, but extinction and survival of, of other species of life, then we ought to exercise it with, with, um, with, with some sort of moral sense. I mean, wh why make something extinct if we don't have to? He authored or contributed to a series of dramatically titled books about threats to nature. And he took advantage of his access to governments the world over. He helped to set up the Worldwide Fund for Nature, and he led it for years. On a visit to the pandas in China, he highlighted the need to save them and their habitats. And he went live on television with David Attenborough to make that point. The panda range has been squeezed between mountains on one side and human encroachment on the other. It is important to conservation worldwide. It's been absolutely huge. You can go anywhere in the world, you know, and he will know where you have to make the connection, where you have to put the pressure, what you have to do. Uh, and he's very uh, practical in those terms. But he didn't always help himself. There was the tiger. In the 60s, he joined tiger hunts. And he once shot a tiger in India. This image was to remain controversial. It was later said that tigers weren't considered endangered back then. But Prince Philip did have his own distinct views. He supported fox hunting and the shooting of game birds, which set him at odds with many environmentalists. There is an advantage in, in people wanting to shoot because 
if you have a game species, you want it to survive because you want to have some more next year. It's exactly like a farmer. You want to crop it. You don't want to, you don't want to exterminate it. So this was a man with his own brand of environmental concern. And he did not like being labelled. Would you describe yourself as, as a green? As green? No. No. Why not? Well, because I think that, that there's, there's a difference between being concerned for the conservation of nature and um, being a bunny hugger. When I was president of WWF, I got more letters about people, the way animals were treated in zoos, than about any concern for the, for the survival of a, of a species. But people can't get their heads around the idea of, survive, of a species surviving. And as far back as 1970, with a young Prince Charles by his side, he was typically forthright about the need to be realistic in the fight for nature. After all, even naturalists drive cars occasionally. And having accepted that, we must go a step further and recognize that compromises have to be reached. Disagreement is inevitable, but the groups must go on meeting because we have simply got to hammer out answers to problems which are going to affect all life in these islands for generations to come. In many ways, Prince Philip was ahead of his time, using his fame as a royal to raise awareness of conservation. An early environmentalist who did not want to be called that, a unique campaigner for a cause that's ever more relevant. David Shookman, BBC News. Well, we can take a look at some other news now. And first, the latest government figures on COVID. There were 2,589 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. On average, 2,710 new cases were reported per day in the past week. Across the UK, the latest figures showed 2,882 people were in hospital with coronavirus, with 40 deaths reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, 36 deaths were announced every day. The total number of people who have died is now 127,080. As for vaccinations, 106,878 people have had their first dose of a COVID vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, bringing the total to 32,010,244, which is over 60% of the adult population. More than 450,000 people had their second jab in the latest 24-hour reporting period. That's the largest number of second doses in a day. It means nearly 7 million people have now had both doses of the vaccine. The Irish Prime Minister, Michal Martin, has warned that Northern Ireland must not be allowed to spiral back into sectarian murders and political discord. The Taoiseach's remarks, made on the 23rd anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, came after a 12th night of unrest in parts of Belfast. 14 police officers have been injured. The reality TV star Nikki Graham, who found fame as a contestant on Big Brother, has died. She was 38 and was being treated for an eating disorder. Her family have asked for privacy at what they said was a tragic and difficult time. Activists in Myanmar say the military brutally suppressed a protest in the city of Bugo yesterday, killing dozens of people. Witnesses told local media soldiers used heavy weapons and shot at anything that moved. More than 600 people have been killed in protests since February's coup. India has reported a record number of daily coronavirus infections, more than 145,000. There have also been 794 deaths, the largest tally in more than five months. The surge is being blamed on a reluctance to wear masks and on crowding. The situation, it's said, has been worsened by a general shortage of vaccines, drugs and hospital beds. OK, time for the sport now with Carthy Niana Seagram at the BBC Sports Centre and a lot in store. Carthy, hello. There is, Kate. Thank you. There has been a two-minute silence at sports events across the country, including at Aintree today as a mark of respect for the Duke of Edinburgh. The Grand National Race was won by Minella Times, ridden by Rachel Blackmore, who becomes the first female jockey to win the Grand National. Andy Swiss reports. A day when racing paid its respects. The jockeys wearing black armbands and the flags at half-mast. The Duke of Edinburgh had been an honorary member of the jockey club and before the first race, Aintree fell silent.
Well, the atmosphere here at Aintree is understandably subdued. Also because there are no spectators here, COVID restrictions mean that for the first time in the Nationals' history, it's behind closed doors. They're off and racing. Soon, though, they set out over Aintree's fences. Of the 40 starters, 15 finished the race, and one horse, the long mile, was put down following an injury. As they jumped the final fence, it was Rachel Blackmore on Minella Times that led the way, and a sporting milestone beckoned. No female jockey had ever won the national, but Blackmore held on for history. Rachel Blackmore raises the bar! For the 31-year-old from County Tipperary, a triumph to savour, and for racing, a landmark moment. What does it mean to win it? It means everything. Um, it really does. Like, it's... it's it's hard to even comprehend it right now, to be honest. It hasn't even sunk in. Um, you know, the Andrew Grand National is, is the first race as a kid that would have caught my imagination or sparked my interest. To finish with your head in front is just beyond belief, to be honest. A Grand National in unprecedented circumstances then has produced an unprecedented winner. Andy Swiss, BBC News, Aintree. The English Football League has announced that next week's games scheduled for 3pm will be moved to avoid being at the same time as the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh. Now, if you don't want to know today's results, it is time to pop out of the room as match of the day and sports scene follows soon on BBC One. There was something of a surprise result in the Premier League with leaders Manchester City defeated 2-1 by Leeds United, who were down to 10 men for the second half of the game. Stuart Dallas scored both of Leeds' goals. In the day's other Premier League games, Liverpool beat Aston Villa 2-1 and Chelsea are back in the top four after their 4-1 victory over Crystal Palace. Hearts have earned an immediate return to the Scottish Premiership. They are winners of the Scottish Championship title after nearest rivals Wraith Rovers and Dundee both drew today. Well, in the Scottish Premiership, second-placed Celtic thrashed Livingston 6-0. There were also wins for Aberdeen, Dundee United and Motherwell, while Kilmarnock and Ross County drew. England's women are through to Rugby Union's Six Nations final after beating Italy by 67 points to three. The nine-try win puts the defending champions into the final of the tournament, which has a new one-off format for this year. And Ireland had a 45 points to nil win over Wales. In Rugby League's Challenge Cup last year's beaten finalist Salford beat Championship side Widnes by 68 points to four to reach the quarterfinals. Holders' leads are out after they were defeated 26 points to 18 by St Helens. There were also wins today for Catalans, Dragons and Hull FC. Rugby Union's European Champions Cup results are on the BBC Sport website along with the latest from the third round of golf's Masters at Augusta National, Kate. Lovely, Carthy. Thank you so much. And um, let's just return to our main story and those tributes to the Duke of Edinburgh. Thousands of people have their own personal memories having met him at official engagements over the years. On his 50th birthday in 1971, the Queen and Prince Philip visited the shipyard at Baron Furness in Cumbria, where they met twin sisters who remember the encounter to this day. They shared their recollections with our North of England correspondent, Judith Moritz. <laughs> Today at Barrow, the first of a new class of British warship takes the water. The launch of HMS Sheffield in 1971 was a momentous day, a real royal occasion. And for two people in particular, it was very special. Twin sisters Sheila and Anne present the traditional bouquet to the Queen. The sisters represent the twin industries of shipbuilding and engineering. Fifty years on, Sheila and Anne remember meeting the Queen and especially the Duke of Edinburgh. It was an honour to, to represent the town. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not every day you get to meet the Queen and a Prince in one day, is it? But it was also the 50th birthday of the Duke, so the whole atmosphere was absolutely amazing. And you remember him putting you at ease? As he came towards us, you could almost see him smiling. He was dying to ask us questions. I think he was just so in awe that there was two girls that were so similar that he thought he would have a little job. <laughs> just said to us you're so alive you really must get up to some kind of fun with your boyfriends and doing <laughs> swapping and we just laughed it off and said no we don't really but of course the photograph that got caught was this business where he's doing this which is you know do you swap boyfriends but that was it in yeah. a twinkle in his eye oh yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little bit of fun you know what he was like <laughs>
What's this one? Happy birthday from the gorgeous girls. <laughs> The twins were surprised to find themselves in next day's papers. Sheila has kept all the mementos. Which one of you is which? I'll have to look up. I think... Are you not sure? No, I'm not. Just a minute. <laughs> we were in every, every daily paper. And I do remember one of the managers from Vickers at the time said, Crikey, you wouldn't think that they'd launched a ship yesterday. <laughs> Less about the ship, more Less about a, you. More about the twins and his birthday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Memories of the day have sadly outlasted HMS Sheffield, which was sunk during the Falklands conflict. As for the twins, they'll never forget the Duke and the fun few moments they shared. He was a very handsome man, wasn't he? You know, he was dashing, wasn't he? Especially when he had his uniform. I mean, who, who doesn't like a man in a uniform, you know? <laughs> Indeed so. Judith Moritz reporting there. Well, Andrew Mark will be here on BBC One at nine o'clock tomorrow morning with guests including Sir John Major and Dr John Sentamy. But that's all from us here. Have a very good evening. Good night. Bye-bye.